Next on Max TV, we take a look back at Butte Andrade and we preview Paul Williams against Sergio Martinez. Coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round brought to you by Everlast. Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim once again talking, boxing. Hope everyone out there had a great Thanksgiving holiday weekend, or at least better than Tiger Woods. Let's begin <laughs> round number one. It was boxing after dark from Quebec City, Quebec, from the Pepsi Coliseum for the IBF Super Middleweight Championship of the World. And it was repeat, not revenge, Lucien Butte with a KO and four over Labrado Andrade. And for the vacant IBF lightweight title, someone called the authorities. Ali Funica, Joe Juan Guzman fight to a controversial 12-round draw, 116-112, two scorecards, 114-114. Gabe, uh, I thought Labrado Andrade was going to be game. I thought he was going to be tough, but I thought Butte was going to win the fight. So did you. But we had a lot of different scenarios. Him getting stretched out in round number four, knocked down, and then pulverized and paralyzed by a body shot, I have to admit, in a million years, I never would have dreamt of that scenario. No, not, not at all. I mean, you know, for the first two, three rounds, I was like, oh, great, here we go. It's going to be another long night watching Butte kind of, you know, I, I thought he'd win, but I thought he'd win, you know, running away. Uh, and this time he just, you know, he absolutely sat down on some of the punches. He started mapping out the things that he was going to do. And, you know, Andrade, he followed him around, and that was basically the, the story of the fight. He had one guy who was... You know, Butte to me looked like what a KG fighter should look like. He kind of stepped away, moved away. He didn't really grab and hold too much and just kind of pitter patted from the outside until he was able to kind of mix in a hard shot. That, that left uppercut hook to the body was a thing of beauty, man. It was just a textbook body shot. It was the type of shot that I think every Mexican fighter would approve of. And it goes yeah. to show you once again, Lebrado Andrade, say what you want about him, say what you want about what happened this weekend in Quebec. He is still among the toughest human beings in the game today. <laughs> that being said, if you get hit on the button on the right spot, I don't care who you are, you get hit like that, you will fall and you will stay down. Uh, I think this fight was headed to another tough rough, rugged, grinding, 12-round conclusion, but all that, the plug was pulled with one perfect body shot. Well, that, I think, you know, that, that left along the ropes that set it up, they got that first knockdown yeah. going. You know, it was Andrade just following around, and, and it was a nice counter left, uh, you know, straight left shot from Butte. It was just beautiful. It, it, to me, he seemed like a guy to, that was something to prove. You know, all the other fights leading up to this, uh, you know, technically, he, he's very proficient. Um, he's a very sound boxer. He's an undefeated guy. He does have some pop, but there was a, there was a certain passion that was missing from him, a, a feeling that he wanted to, you know, win the fight uh, any way he could as opposed to just looking for points. And in this fight, he had something to prove, and, and damn, he proved it. Well, we always knew he was a great ticket seller out there in the Quebec province. Now I think he made a statement. He is absolutely one of the world's elite 168-pounders. Here's the problem, though, Gabriel. Now what? The Super 6 on the other network has taken most of your blue chip marquee super middleweights off the dance card. Where do you go now if you're Lucien Boutte in inner box? You know, you've got Saki Obika is out there. That's a solid opponent. Tough guy? Uh, yeah, a very tough guy. You know, he fought uh, and gave Joe Calzaghi, what, you know, what for. Uh, you know, and you also got Alan Green out there who's always running his mouth and saying he's, he should be in the Super 6 too. You know, both those guys are, are, would be great fights and be huge ticket sellers. I think those are really viable options for him. Uh, Gabe, before this fight took place, we had controversy, and I think perhaps the worst decision in a very, very long time. This makes Diaz Malinaji look like justice was served. Ali Funica, in my opinion, lost the first two rounds. From rounds 3 to 12, I think he may have dropped one more. Joan Guzman was bruised, battered, and bloodied, and staggered in the eighth. Nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts. He was screwed. I think an absolute perversion of justice. And I'm not saying that there's anything corrupt, but this certainly looked like a Golden Boy House decision in uh, Quebec. Yeah, Ollie got straight finiked. It, it was Whoa. Just, it was it was ugly, man. <laughs> you know, the, the two guys with Alan Davis and uh, Benoit Russell. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. Uh, you know, Ben Russell here in the in the states. Uh, they had a 114-114. How they had this fight a draw? I mean, they must have been counting, you know, uh, Ali Funica landing punches on, on Joan Guzman's faces, face as, as, you know, punches landed or something. It was just flat out ridiculous. I, I don't see at all how this was a close fight, much less a draw. Uh, uh, Ali Funica is absolutely the biggest 135 pounder I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, ridiculous. Looking at those two guys, Joan Guzman was more of a natural featherweight 122 pounder. He really did look like he was two or three weight classes below Ali Funica, who looks like a big, strong welterweight. Yeah. Uh, I thought from rounds three through 12, when he started to get into the fight, 
I thought his jab, his reach, and a right hand, and the ability to really keep Guzman on the outside. And I also think Guzman technically has really regressed. Oh, his yeah. punches now are just slaps. He doesn't really turn over his punches. There's not a real sharpness to his shots anymore. And I thought there was a certain time he just started to float. He really had no clue how to deal with the overall range and the length of Ali Funica. I'll say this about Ali Funica. He's not unbeatable. That's been shown. But I tell you what, if you're any 135-pounder in the world, he is among the most difficult outs in all of boxing. Yeah, I think from 135 to, to 140 even, he's, he's it's a matchup problem. Being a, a 6'1 guy that's going to fight from the outside, that can bang on the inside. And, you know, I think maybe his chin might improve a little bit uh, as he moves up and gets a little more strength. To me, Fanica seems like a guy that's uh, 31 years old and 6'1". Uh, is struggling to make weight a little bit, and he seems to fade down the stretch. But, you know, Guzman, to me, has got to be pound for pound one of the biggest wastes of talent we've seen in recent years. Uh, he's a guy that, that doesn't fight very often anymore. He's as skilled as any fighter out there, but the rust just seems to show. He, he's more defensive. He, he, does, he sees the openings. He doesn't shoot through them. His offense is, is almost nowhere to be found in the back end of fights. I, I don't know where he goes from here. Maybe off TV and kind of retools and fights often. Uh, I'm not really sure what to do with it. The him. way I would describe him, Gabe, all serious. Not a lot of stake. That's no. Juan Guzman. And I thought his last dominant performance was way back in, I believe, 2003 or 4 against Agapito Sanchez. Problem was, that was about six, seven years ago at 122 pounds. Yeah. But here's the thing I think we might be seeing this fight again. This was for the vacant IBF lightweight title. Gary Shaw, from what I'm told, will protest this. And I think if there's any justice served, at the very least, whoever fights for the vacant title of the IBF. Ali Funica should definitely be on that dossier. The Absolutely. question is, even with this rotten decision, will Joan Guzman get the rematch? I think right there, that would be an injustice. We've already seen Ali Funica conclusively beat Joan Guzman. Make yeah. the title vacant. Let Ali Funica fight for it again, but I say you go to the next highest rated contender. Yeah. I don't need to see this fight again. Absolutely. It, you know, for them to even you know, reorder a, a, you know, another fight for the interim belt and have Ali Funica as, as one of the guys fighting for it is a way of saying, you know what, he flat out beat this guy. We don't need to see him fight again. Yeah, move somebody else up and let's give them another shot. You know, but, you know, Ali Funica's also got a lot of options. He can move up to 140. There's plenty of names up there. Mm -hmm. Kendall Holt, you know, Ricardo Torres, uh, all kinds of Dave, names. you know the problem with uh, that, though? I disagree. I, I think he needs a title belt because you're talking about a guy that is 6'1", is like a praying mantis, is a durable guy, can punch a little bit. Unless he has the hardware around the belt, and I've talked about this ad nauseum, yeah. fighters like Ali Funica need the hardware because yeah. if you're a manager or promoter of a rival fighter, Unless that is on the line, Gabe, you don't get in there with them. Yeah, just ask Paul Williams. Absolutely, and he still can't get fights, and yeah. we'll talk about him coming up. When we come back, round number two of the next round, brought to you by Everlast. And we are back on the next round. Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim, talking boxing. Round number two, we go to Atlantic City, New Jersey, for another edition of HBO's Championship Boxing Middleweights in action, the Punisher, Paul Williams, takes on Sergio Martinez. And heavyweights in action, Chris Ariola takes on Brian Minto. Williams, Sergio Martinez, somewhat of a buzzkill. This is like being promised filet mignon, and you kind of get a Salisbury steak. This was supposed to be Kelly Pavlik before a staph infection knocked out that fight. Here's the thing. I think stylistically, though, from a pure boxing standpoint, Sergio Martinez is southpaw. He's fleeter of foot, probably a quicker fighter. He's going to use more lateral movement. Stylistically, I'm not saying he's better, but he might be a more difficult challenge for Paul Williams than Kelly Pavlik. Yeah, at the very least, he's going to be more difficult to look good against. I mean, you know, Martinez is such a mover, he might as well have a sign on the back of his trunk that says, how am I running, you know? But <laughs> I think Williams, he's learning how to fight at range uh, very well. He's got 83-inch reach. Uh, at this point, he should know how to fight, you know, at long range. And, and the way Martinez kind of uh, prances around the, the edges of the ring, that might actually play right into Williams' game plan. Uh, you know, he's t turning into less of a volume puncher and more of a pinpoint kind of counter guy, or he, he tends to lead with the jab. Uh, I, I think Williams is going to take this fight all day. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he gets a straight-out unanimous decision or even a late stoppage here. Yeah, Sergio Martinez, I hope, takes risk. Uh, yeah. I know that he's supposed to be the underdog here. He's really a natural 54-pounder. But I just hate when guys get these big opportunities on HBO and Showtime. And the victory is not even getting the victory. The victory is getting that license fee and collecting three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. I just don't know if Sergio Martinez, like a Carlos Quintana in their first fight, is going to really challenge Paul Williams. I think one of the things you have to do with Paul Williams 
in and out movement and lateral movement is yeah. key. But once you step in that pocket, you've got to be willing to take the risk and then get out. The yeah. one thing I've been noticing about Sergio Martinez, even in the fight I thought he won against Kermit Citron, I don't think he hung in the pocket and really let his hands go enough. And that's no. what concerns me about this fight. Yeah, when you look back at the you know the first Carlos Quintana, uh, Paul Williams fight, Quintana, you know, he fought in and out, side to side. He, he didn't, you know, he would take a little bit and then and get out. But he would also stay on the inside at times and took advantage of Paul Williams not being the best infighter in the world. Uh, and, and was able to dig to his body and, and score that way. Martinez isn't that guy. He's a long-range guy who will, you know, he, he wants to keep his opponent on the outside of his jab and, you know, maybe, you know, mix in some straight leads uh, or, you know, some one-two shots. With Williams, that's going to be a problem. Well, He's the small guy here. One thing you have to do with Paul Williams, and most tall, lanky guys, but no matter what their styles, they will have some problems with angles and lateral movement because they have to shift and they have to reset. It takes them a little bit yep. longer than a short, compact fighter. That's the one thing Quintana did, at least in the first fight against Paul Williams. He worked on the inside and subtly changed angles and made it a little bit harder for Paul Williams to shoot down the middle because he certainly is a volume puncher. I like Williams to win a 12-round decision. I think that may be more dull than exciting. But I think this is a shootout here. And I know people are ripping this matchup. But you know what? This is a fun fight. I don't care if it's ESPN2 caliber. You know what? <laughs> Every once in a while, I want to see a Donnybrook. And I think when Minto and Areola, as I like to say, they don't need MapQuest to find each other. No, no. There's no GPS needed here, man. <laughs> These two guys are just, the bell's going to ring, and they're just going to come to the center and go for it. Uh, this, is a, this is a perfect fight for Areola. I was really uh, impressed and surprised when he decided to go ahead and come back so soon after his loss to, to Vitaly Klitschko uh, back in September. This is a pretty quick turnaround for him, and he should be able to keep his weight down. Um, not a lot of time out of the gym. And, and Minto is a perfect opponent. He does have some pop. Uh, you know, he's got, what, like, something like 24 knockouts, but, but you know, it's not against the, the top-level opponents. He can be outboxed, although I don't think Ariel is going to be looking to outbox him. But he doesn't have, the, you know, the kind of punch that, that's going to change the fight on, on one shot. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great opponent for him. Yeah, because stickers and movers, like a Klitschko, either one, will always trouble Chris Ariola. Mm -hmm. And I think this, here, I know the fight's December 5th, but this might as well be December 25th for Henry Ramirez, Dan Goosen, and Daryl Hudson because they needed a quick turnaround. Yeah. Now, I thought it was ridiculous that Chris Areola, for the Klitschko fight, came into camp right around 295. Uh, I think he was much lighter this time because he didn't have time to really rest, relax, and really get fat like a torta. Uh, I think here, <laughs> Areola Minto is a great stylistic matchup. Both yeah. guys are going to be in the center of the ring, banging away. I get the sense, though, that Areola's at a higher class. I think he wins an exciting slugfest. I say a knockout between round six, seven, or eight. Wow. Uh, I won't go that early. I'd say late stoppage, uh, around 10. I think Ariel has got the better jab. He's got a little bit straighter punches. You know, Minto tends to kind of wing his shots uh, and kind of come in with his chin high up. So I'd say, like, somewhere between, like, you know, 9 and 10. All right. So there you have it. That is HBO's Championship Boxing. We come back. We talk about Roy Jones and Bernard Hopkins. And we are back on the next round. We move on to round number three, and we have boxing on versus. It is the prelude from Philadelphia. Bernard Hopkins takes on Enrique Ornelas, and then from Sydney, Australia, Roy Jones takes on Danny Green. You can watch that on versus, unless you have direct TV. Interesting doubleheader. You know, say what you want about this, but I'm glad that there is a televised outlet, at least for some of us. Bernard Hopkins and Enrique Ornelas. Um, I think this is what you call the proverbial tune-up. This is the Andy Granatelli special. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, Ornelas is, is kind of slow of foot, you know, wide of punch. Uh, he's been outboxed by Marco Antonio Rubio. You know, for the 85-year-old Hopkins, this is the perfect fight, you know, to set up uh, the Roy Jones fight down, you know, down the line. It's kind of a safe fight. Uh, he's not in danger of getting knocked out. I think he should just outbox and possibly stop Ornelas late. Now, Roy Jones, Danny Green, I don't think there's any real danger. I think this, I've heard this is a very, very big event down under. They're going to oh. have a sellout crowd. Lots of money is going to be made. Danny Green, about five, six years ago, was an exciting, hard-hitting guy. But again, I just get the sense right now he's more of a faded guy who's a big name in Australia. And Roy Jones, still one of the best managers that has ever lived, I think has an opportunity to look very, very good here. Yeah, you know, Danny Green is, is an interesting guy. He was, he was an up-and-coming guy, uh, you know, a, a big name in Australia, and was looking to, to burst out on the international scene. Um, he had a loss, and then, you know, he ended up taking like a two-year layoff, and now he's been on a two-fight win streak. But, you know, he's a big guy at 6'1". Um, he's got a lot of knockouts, you know, 24 KOs. 
Uh, he's a guy that, that is very dangerous fight, in my opinion, for what? Roy Jones. You think so? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I mean, think there's a reason why they picked Danny Green. I mean, one thing about Roy Jones, is he now the RJ that was the RJ of the late 90s, early 2000s? Absolutely not. But I think we've seen in 2008 and 9, he could beat the Omar Sheikas of the world. He could look good against the Jeff Lacey's of the world. Yeah. And you know what? I think Danny Green right now is in that category. I think Roy Jones wins this fight convincingly. Well, yeah, I mean, at his best, Danny you know, uh, Green uh, lost to Anthony Mundine and, and Marcus Beyer, who are not, you know, the greatest, you know, fighters in the world. I mean, they're kind of slow themselves or they're kind of limited themselves. Uh, but, you know, to me, Roy Jones, he has not aged as well as, as Bernard Hopkins in that, you know, he's not really a, a technically sound fighter. He's got uh, some leaky defense, and maybe he's fixed that over the last few years or adjusted to his lack of speed as he's aged. I, I just have a funky feeling about this well, fight, Steve. one thing about Roy Jones, his chin is not exactly George Chavala, and you talk no. about the aging process, you're right, because reflexive fighters who are so dependent on speed and quickness and getting a, being able to get away with technical mistakes with their physical prowess, as they turn a certain age, they do start to become a little bit more exposed. Now, Jones Hopkins, should they win and come out relatively clean, it looks like March 13th they will face each other at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas on a pay-per-view show. We've already said this, and I think this much is clear. This rematch is about eight years too late in the making. But I still think there's going to be some intrigue here because people recognize who Roy Jones and Bernard Hopkins is. Oh, yeah. My two-part question is this. Who is favored when they fight? And number two, do you give a damn? Uh, Hopkins is going to be favored. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of morbidly curious about this fight. You know, I don't really give that much of a damn, but I kind of do. I, I, I tend to think that, that Hopkins, he's aged like wine, as opposed to Roy Jones, who, who's turned a little bit to vinegar here. Uh, in their first fight, it was Jones's athleticism and speed that made the difference up against a kind of greener Hopkins, who wasn't, you know, quite the world beater that he is now. Uh, I think Hopkins beats him up, and I think he stops him late. And for the record, uh, I'm going to go with the upset special here, Steve. I'm a little worried about Roy Jones in this fight. Wait, I, think, you, wait, wait I think jumping back to Danny Green, I, I think he's a, he's a banger. He's got real power. He had a two-year rest where he kind of re refreshed himself. He's on a two-fight win streak. Granted, it, it's not against you know the top-level opposition like a Roy Jones. I got a bad feeling about this fight. I'm going to go Danny Green by surprise late stoppage. Wow. That is the biggest thing in Australia since men at work. Yeah. You're going with the man down under. I am going with the man down under. I, I find that to be very interesting. Now, but let's say Hopkins Jones 2 does take place. I think it's interesting from a pay-per-view standpoint. I think the one way that they will be able to attract the general fan and also the hardcore enthusiast, and it's actually good news, they're going to have to put on a very good undercard. Oh, For a yeah. show of this caliber, you can't get away with Yuri Borman and Julio Cesar Butterbean. Or can you? They did do a you know 1.25 yeah, billion right. pay-per-views, so maybe they can. But I, I tend to agree. This is going to be boxing on a big stage. It's the last generation's two big fighters, you know, getting it on in a, a rematch that finally is happening. They, they got to do something big for this. All right. So there you have it. We come back. We wrap it up on the next round with news and notes. And we wrap it up here on the next round. Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya, talking boxing. We go to news and notes, so we go to the fight review. One fight of note on Showbox from Pachanga. Martin Onario with an upset over Johnny Molina, handing him his first loss, a 10-round decision. And then in a very exciting slugfest between junior featherweights, Rico Ramos with an 8-round decision over Alejandro Perez. Now here's the thing uh, about Johnny Molina. I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback, but I'd like to think I was Peyton Manning here. I said a <laughs> long time ago, even though I picked... Molina to win the fight. I said anyone from the outside that could move is really going to expose his deficiencies from the outside, but I was stunned. Martin Onario, not known for being exactly Vernon Forrest, looked like a Mexican Vernon Forrest with the sticking and moving on this night. Yeah, apparently Onario either reads your articles or watches <laughs> TNR or both. Because, you know, for the first time ever, the guy was sticking from the outside, bouncing on his toes, he was throwing combinations. He looked like a million bucks. I mean, it was a combination to me of you know, there's a lot of deficiencies in, in Molina's game, and, and Onario just fighting out of his head. He, he fought one of the best fights he's ever fought, if not the best fight of his life. Uh, you know, after the fight, I got a text from uh, Molina's father. He let me know that, that coming into the fight, Molina actually had a really terrible flu. He was uh, deathly ill all week. Uh, you know, he made the weight a little uh, different than he wanted to and a little sooner than he wanted to. It was kind of weak coming into the fight. But, you know, that all said, yeah, his legs looked bad and he looked 
pretty listless to me. He got straight out boxed. He's yeah. got a lot of issues he needs to work out. You know, I've said this to a lot of people, including Joe Goosen, who built Rafael Ruelas, who I think is the closest comparison you can make to his past protégés. The thing about Johnny Molina, there's a lot of little things. People have to remember, in high school, he did more wrestling than boxing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the boxing IQ needs to be raised. And also, he's still a guy that paints by numbers. He's still very formulaic. He can't think on the fly. And when Onario started sticking the jab, offsetting him with movement, and moving around the ring, yeah. well, I don't think he could really make that adjustment and calculate that into his head. Yeah. I think there's a lot of little things that in totality are actually very big. You, t you heard Joe Goosen. The punching frame. He got very wide. He's also very squared up. Yeah. Footwork and balance is one of the things they're really going to have to work on because he looked spinning out of control like a top all night. And yeah. I think this loss is not the worst thing. I think the pacing and the marketing of Johnny Molina was a little bit too fast. Yeah. This guy is still very, very green. And in a perfect world game, which may not exist, I would take him off TV and fight him every month and let him just learn by osmosis and yeah. muscle memory. Yeah, four or five fights off TV, you know, and uh, if you're going to be a pressure fighter that, you know, he's 5'11 and 135, you know, is huge for the weight class. If you're going to be a pressure fighter, you got to work on cutting off the ring, which, you know, goes yeah. back to your footwork. He just followed around all night, eight jabs, there was no head movement. You know, like you said, the, you know, the guard, this is actually not a tight guard, this is. You know, and he just he just ate jabs all night, and there was counter punching opportunities left and right. With you know, Anario bringing his left hand back slowly after jabbing, and and low to you know, to boot, and, and he never really uh, Molina never really adjusted to that. I mean, they really need to work on everything. I mean, really boxing one on one, from how to have a proper stance, yeah. because as the fight started to develop and things started to unravel and get really tough, well, what happened was I think to me that Johnny Molina started to look like a rudderless ship and every bad habit that he came into this with started to revert and you saw what happened he, he was kind of like that rudderless ship stuck out on the ocean and by the fourth fifth round you had this feeling there was going to be an upset special and I give Martin Onario credit I didn't think he was big enough because he's really a natural featherweight yeah. but you know what he conclusively beat Johnny Molina and I think at 130 to 126 I think once again he's a player Take away that one big knockout loss to Robert Guerrero. This guy has been a tough guy to beat. Yeah, he's going to be a problem. I mean, he's he's a lanky guy. You know, five five nine and a half. You know, for for the weight class, he, he's, he's just going to be a, a problem. I, I think he's kind of he's ranked number nine by the IBF at, at one thirty right now, and he's kind of moving back in line, heading uh, towards a rematch with Guerrero. And, and, to, and to top it all off, he's an all action, great TV fighter. Yes. I can't wait to see him again. And leading off this broadcast, Gabe, is what I thought was perhaps the best back and forth battle. I've seen on Showbox in a while. Rico yeah. Ramos is now, I believe, 13-0. And here's a kid that's been kept active. He's been very, very busy. And I tell you, I like him. He's slick, but you know what? He's not slick to the point of stinking it out. Him and Alejandro Perez had a great back-and-forth battle. And you know what? What's that old saying? Speed kills. And it certainly damaged Alejandro Perez. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, Alejandro Perez, I actually picked him in this fight. I thought that you know, Ramos would be a little bit too reluctant and the volume of, of Perez would take over in this fight. And, and it, for the first round, it looked that, like it was going to be that way. You know, Perez just digs right in. He's a very, you know, much a wild card type fighter, which is where he trains. Uh, all aggression. He digs to the body. Uh, and it kind of tries to trap you in the corners and along the ropes. But Ramos adjusted beautifully, man. Yeah. Sort of a step back, counter. He even kind of led him into traps on the ropes and in the corners and was countering well and, and found a home for that uppercut as Perez kind of comes in, you know, kind of over that front foot. It was, it was a beautiful performance. Yeah, unfortunately for Alejandro Perez with that type of style, you wish his hands were a little bit heavier or he had more power yeah. because you can overcome the lack of speed and quickness if you could really bang. Yeah. He's a solid puncher. He's kind of a workman guy in there. Yeah. But he's not a guy like a young Barrera that when he hits you, you could really feel it. Uh, moving on to the fight preview. Plenty of stuff going on here. Thursday night on Versus, Mighty Mike Arna Otis takes on Tim Coleman. Friday on Showbox, Tyrone Brunson, knockout artist, takes on Carson Jones. Then Mauricio Herrera takes on Mighty Mike Unchando. And then Friday in France with a WBA Bantamweight title, Anselmo Moreno takes on Frederick Patrak. Going back to Arna Otis, here's what I find interesting. Here's a guy that I thought got absolutely robbed against Ricardo Torres for one of the WBO Junior Welterweight titles back on a, one of the big undercards. And it goes to show you, and this is what we talk about the robbery, Ali Funika's robbery should not be overlooked because Mighty Mike Arna Udis never seemed to regain his bearings after that very controversial yeah. decision. And we've seen fighters mentally, even Jeff Fennick, after that horrible decision he got against uh, Azuma Nelson in their first fight, these guys never recover emotionally. And then financially, all the work they put in, 
they don't reap the benefits of getting the decision they deserve. Arno Udis, I thought at one time, looked like a pretty good, solid fighter. But you know what? Since that fight against Torres, he's never really been the same. No, and, and, and in a way, the, the way the boxing world looks at him is completely different. Now he's treated like an opponent. You know, uh, I was talking with his manager earlier this week and, and, and his publicist, and they were telling me about the, the lead-in to the Ortiz fight, that he wasn't even uh, allowed to really warm up. He got in, in there, yeah. and about, you know, about 30 minutes... Uh, after being in the locker room, they're like, all right, it's time to go. And he, he taped up his hands, and, and they sent him out there. Meanwhile, he sees on the screen as he's entering Ortiz warming up in the dressing room and, and you know, hitting the pads and everything. He was totally treated like an opponent. And that doesn't, you know, take away from Ortiz's performance, but it's the perception, you know, uh, losing a fight like that. He's, he's never quite recovered. Now, this is definitely, a, you know, a get-back fight for him, and it's a good opponent for him. But I'm really curious to see how mentally he recovers from, yeah. from both those losses. And Jose Navarro in Japan about three, four years ago had another shafting, and he never really recovered. That's why bad decisions need to be talked about, and they need to be rectified. Tyrone Brunson, here's a guy that I I've read about talk about a completely built up record folks this is not edwin valero and i'm gonna say it right now carson jones forget the record i think is a more seasoned guy he gives everyone tough rounds i don't know if you can really call it this but folks i'm looking at the menu yes give me the upset special <laughs> i like carson city jones yeah you know carson city is, is going to be a problem for brunson who, who you got like a majority draw against some dude that that maybe had like won like five six fights i mean he's not you know, he's fought a bunch of guys with a lot of red on their box rec record. You know, uh, he's yeah, a, so much red you think they're giving blood. Yeah, seriously. I mean, he's got wild, uh, wide technique, and he kind of fell, you know, into the trap that Valero started to fall into when he, they started getting these first round knockout streaks going, where he just came out looking for the knockout. He throws wide punches. He gets a little crazy. The chin goes a little bit high. I want to stick with Brunson in this fight. I think maybe he's settled down a little bit, uh, and I think maybe the power is for real. I'm going to stick with him. He's the favorite. Uh, it's going to offset my Danny Green pick this mm. week. Right. Also on this card, Marisa Herrera, a good-looking junior waltzweight, takes on the comebacking mighty Mike Onchando and Gabe. And Selmo Moreno is one of my favorite boxers. Uh, I'm not saying he's Pernell Whitaker, but he's a slick southpaw. And I think in a very, very deep and talented bantamweight division, uh, I think Moreno is one of the most most talented guys out there. Yeah, anyone on Chondo, talk about another guy who had never really recovered from a loss. Yeah. You know, he, he got knocked out by, by Barrios, and then, you know, uh, a few years later, he, he gets stopped by Darling Jimenez. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. I think Moreno's going to be the guy in this one. And talking about fights that are taking place, a busy week of fights. It is Championship Saturday from Newcastle, England, for the WBA Junior Welterweight title. Amir Khan takes on Dimitri Salida, and then in Germany, for the WBO Cruiserweight title, Marco Huck takes on Ola Afalabi. Uh, I gotta say this, I think Amir Khan wins somewhat of a boring fight. Dimitri Salida, uh, how this guy became number one mandatory is very, very shaky. Look at that record. I'm gonna say it right now for Salida. Excuse the pun, it ain't kosher. Yeah, yeah, be beating me actually shouldn't get you a title <laughs> shot. You know, uh, Dimitri Salida is a guy that was, you know, seemed to be rising uh, over the past few years, and then he just plateaued. Uh, he changed promoters, I believe, and then a couple he, times. Yeah, a couple times, and and really hasn't gone anywhere. He's kind of uh, a built-up record. I, I think Khan maybe can get a stoppage here. He's not really sitting on his yeah. punches quite as much as I'd like to, but I look for him to completely outclass Salida and maybe stop him late. Yeah, I agree. It, uh, class. I, I think Khan has much more natural talent. Now here is an interesting fight. Ola Afalabi, uh, a couple of months ago, way back in actually March beat Enzo Macronelli by rope-a-doping in the death. And nobody can rope-a-dope like Ola Afalabi. No. He's going to Germany. I'm just wondering, will he do enough to win this fight? I think he's more talented than Marco Huck. But if he just lays on the ropes and he can't hit him with that blind shot, you never know what could happen. Ask Holly Funica. Yeah, yeah. You know, Marco Huck is, is a really durable, rugged guy. Um, you know, stylistically, you know, Afalabi should win. And he is the champion, so he should get some benefits of the doubt. But he's on foreign soil. Anything could happen. I'm looking for Ola to take a split decision here. Oh, a split decision in Germany. And yeah. one last tidbit here. Last week we reported that Vasquez Marquez 4 would take place on February 27th at the Staples Center. Uh, in my limited Russian, let me just say this. Nyet, nyet, nyet. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Showtime has mixed it because of the Winter Olympics. Because I know all you boxing fans really care about slalom skiing and figure skating. Uh, I don't understand what the fixation is. Folks, this is not 1988. The world has changed. Nobody really gives a damn about the Winter Olympics. Maybe the summer, yeah. not the Winter Olympics. And it looks like the first available date at the Staples Center, because they want to have the fight in our beautiful city where it belongs, May 22nd. Now, I know some people, Gabe, are going to say, oh, my God, we have to wait two more months. It's going to take the luster off this fight. 
Folks, I hate to tell you, we've already almost waited about two years. Yeah. Whatever luster there was, pretty much this fight has died on the vine. These guys shouldn't fight anyone else. If they have to wait two years to wait for an opening at Staples Center, guess what? They should. I didn't even realize we had winter in L.A. <laughs> it's about 75 degrees right now. It's <laughs> yeah. the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah, I don't know what they're waiting for. But, you know, hey, let them rest. They've had a lot of rough fights. You know, it'll, they'll be a little fresher if we wait two more months. Right, so there you have it. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR on behalf of Gabriel Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.